in an idyllic almond orchard in Bakersfield, a hellish discovery is made. They find the bloody body of a male lying face up in the dirt, and they call police. A mystery woman is on the run, but two detectives are hard on her heels. Who is in love, and who is in hate? When Todd doesn't come home, police dig deep. The game is on, and this killer is playing for keeps. Bakersfield, California, in the seat of Kern County, is founded in 1869 by Thomas Baker, who reclaimed swamplands along the nearby Kern River. Just two hours north of Los Angeles on the Kern River and known for its arid, scorching summers. Residents are proud of their agricultural community with local carrots, oranges, and almonds. And they serve up some of the most delicious and renowned Basque food on the West Coast. Bakersfield is a cheaper alternative to other areas in California. But as a big oil company town, it ranks at the top of the list for pollution. It's also got the reputation as a dangerous city, and the violent crime rate is one of the highest in the United States. Bakersfield, California, August 25th, 2013. The almond orchard workers have started their day early to beat the heat, but they've made a grim discovery. The location is a pretty almond orchard off Enos Lane and Noriega Road, northwest Bakersfield. They find the bloody body of a male lying face up in the dirt, and they call police. Unfortunately, criminal activity is not uncommon in these places. In this case, the almond groves provide a shield for murder. Police arrive on the scene. There's a male victim who appears to have been shot to death. The sunglasses and wallet are near the body, the cell phone about 40 feet away. The police look at tire marks and footprints, but the victim's shoes are clean. He hasn't set a foot on the ground there. Police identify 45-year-old Todd Chance of Bakersfield, California, by his wallet. This is the hardest thing detectives ever have to do. They go to notify his family. Todd Chance has a wife and three daughters. When the police go to the Chance house, they find his wife, Janae, and his stepdaughter, Jessica, moving old furniture into Jessica's car. When Janae sees the police officers, she fears there's been a car accident. That's her first thought. But the news is even worse. Todd Chance is born in Shafter, a small city in Kern County just 18 miles west-northwest of Bakersfield. Todd loves horses, off-roading, and he and his brother beg their parents for pigs to raise. He's the kind of kid that loves to be outdoors doing farm work. As Todd grows up, he becomes a handsome kid. He loves the mystique of the cowboy and is always wearing cowboy shirts, the belt buckles, the boots. He loves that image. Todd also loves guns, and he drives a flashy 76 Mustang. Girls definitely take notice of him, and they flirt with him constantly. Todd goes to work in asset protection at a drugstore, and there he meets Janae. She's a divorced mother of one daughter, Jessica. Janae is attracted instantly to Todd's rugged good looks, but she has no interest in dating a player. She's been burned before, left by her ex when she was pregnant. She doesn't want to let herself be vulnerable to a bad guy ever again. But Todd is a gentleman. After about a year of dating, they get married. At the wedding, Todd presents his stepdaughter with a pearl bracelet with her name on it. Her own wedding gift. Todd shows himself to be a loving and thoughtful stepfather. He and Janae go on to have two daughters of their own. Todd and his girls are very close. He loves being a dad. He 
He graduates from his Mustang to a black sports car and is known to search his exhaust just to get some attention in the neighborhood. He lavishes as much care on his cars as he does on his daughters. Eventually, Todd becomes a professional truck driver, but makes sure he can stay close to home because his family is his top priority. But now that the worst has happened, the family needs all the help and support they can get. Todd's parents rush to the side of Todd's family, and police inform them that Todd has been found shot to death. We're just starting with this thing. We don't want to do it. So. When did this happen? We don't know. They can't understand how this could have happened. Police established that Todd isn't into drugs or gambling. He wasn't a man with dangerous habits. So the clock is ticking here. We're really into that crucial stage of the investigation often referred to as the first 48 hours, where investigators really want to speak with everybody they can as soon as they can, while people's memories are fresh, while video surveillance is still available and not recorded over, environmental factors may not be affecting physical evidence at the scene, really is a crucial time. Todd's wife tells police it's really a typical day. Janae spends her Sunday morning watching TV, doing laundry, working on her computer. There's nothing out of the ordinary, but she's waiting for a delivery. Janae and Todd's two daughters still live at home, and they can confirm this. The one daughter comes down around 9.30 a.m. and sees her mom briefly, and the other comes down around 10 a.m. Janae tells police that she sees Todd around 7.30 or 8 that morning when Todd leaves to take his dad to a gun show. Tell me he's going with you to the gun show, but I didn't know if you guys were meeting there. But that's news to Todd's father. He had no plans to go with Todd to a gun show. I haven't talked to him today. Well, I started calling him a little before 9 and he wouldn't answer. I called him uh, probably 10, 5 minutes before 9. I called him about 10 after he was still asleep. His family can never imagine what the police have to tell them when they first call. Todd's body is found west of town, and that's opposite to the direction where the gun show would have been. I don't understand why he was way out west of town like that. <laughs> they left him. Todd does have a very desirable vehicle, so it's starting to look like this may have been a carjacking. Put up a fight for this car, someone tried to take it. Oh, yeah. Okay, I don't think it was. I don't think it would. Police ask Janae to check, and Janae finds a gun missing from Todd's collection. And he owns several guns, and two handguns, and one of them is missing. And that is the 38. Maybe he brought his 38 revolver with him for protection that day, or maybe he brought it to sell or trade at the gun show. But detectives began to wonder if Todd really was going to the gun show. Todd appears to be your average family man. He has none of the red flags that would indicate a life leading to foul play. He doesn't use drugs? No. He doesn't drink excessively? No. Authorities need something to go on and fast. Then police get a call. Todd Chance's car has been found. They rush to the scene. They need those clues while they're fresh. They're on the trail of a killer. Todd's cell phone reveals explicit photos of an unknown woman and flirty texts. Janae is blindsided by this, as she has always been secure in her relationship. You're a cop, okay? You'll probably be on a TV show someday. When family man Todd Chance is found dead in an almond orchard, his family and police struggle to understand what has happened. 
A freewheeling person with a penchant for flashy cars, his family states that he's headed to a gun show that morning. But his car is found in the opposite direction of where the show is. A 38 revolver is missing from Todd's collection, and his plans for the morning don't seem to make sense. Police suspect a possible carjacking, and when the car is located, they rush to the scene. Detectives respond to a call at a location that's 20 miles away from the Allen Orchard where Todd's body was found on Tiger Flower Drive. The car is noticed by a neighbor who's afraid that the black sports car is so showy it might get stolen. The area is notorious for crime. The car is dusty but otherwise completely intact, so not really what you'd expect to see after a violent carjacking. Strangely, detectives find the car is unlocked and a gun that matches the description of the gun missing from the chance home sits clearly there on the floor of the car. And the car key sits there too, right in view. That the gun could be the murder weapon is possible, but the fact that it's left in plain sight doesn't make much sense. One would expect that if a murder occurred in the spur of a moment, the killer would run away and attempt to dump the gun somewhere where they believed it wouldn't be found. Police are beginning to think this is looking less like a carjacking and more like someone really wants this car to be stolen. Detectives send police out to canvas the neighborhood. The smallest clue or the smallest little bit of information provided by somebody who may have seen something, that could mean everything to the case. And earlier, you checked on his debit card. Yeah. You guys have separate accounts for joint accounts. Account. Account. And the debit card has not been used since last night. Right. Todd and Janae share a bank account, so investigators request bank records to determine if there's been any irregular spending. There doesn't appear to be. Todd's habits seem quite normal. They also ask for information relating to text messages that may have occurred between the two of them. Janae feels good to be busy and helpful, but at the same time, she racks her brain for some detail she's just not remembering that might help to break the case open. Before she learned of her husband's murder, it had been like any other day in their marriage. And about what time did we spawn again? 7.30. I, I'm not sure. We're sitting between 7.30 and 8. Mm -hmm. Where do you work at now? I work at Fairview Elementary. When Janae and Todd meet, she's got a full schedule. She's juggling three part-time jobs, and she's determined to make a success of herself. She finally gets an education degree, becomes a school teacher, and then quickly rises through the ranks to become principal. Now she's earning a six-figure salary and is the main wage earner for the family. Janae and her daughters all sleep together that first night when Todd dies. But Janae doesn't get a wink for worry and fear. Luckily for Janae and the girls, the grandparents are on hand to provide some comfort. It's an unimaginable time for this family. But police aren't sleeping either. They're working around the clock, and it may have paid off. Detectives find a lead across the street from Todd's car. A witness sees a middle-aged white woman wearing a hat and sunglasses park the Mustang and get out. This mystery woman then hurries south. Police make a wide sweep for surveillance video from every source possible, going in all directions. They need to try to track the path of the woman who parked Todd's car. Residents often underestimate how important security cameras can be. It's assumed the cameras are to watch one's own property. But to catch Todd Chance's killer, it's a lead police desperately need. Fortunately, a home right near where Todd's car is found has two security cameras. Captured at 9.02 a.m. from across the street is someone walking swiftly along wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses carrying a plastic bag also appearing to wear a red knapsack. From the video, we can't definitively say that this is a woman, but this person is on the same trajectory at the same time, wearing the same clothes as the person described by the eyewitness as a middle-aged white woman getting out of Todd's car. The suspect walks south, away from Todd's car. Police note a distinctive walk, with the arm swinging up and away from the waist. They continue to scrutinize all the surveillance video from the surrounding area. They pick up the suspect moving east toward a shopping center. In 
In this video, the cops can clearly see the suspect looks female. She's wearing the same clothes, carrying the same bags as she walks into the coffee shop, and then she enters the bathroom. When she comes out, she's wearing dark sweats over her clothes and she's changed her shoes, but no purchase has been made. The person who goes in there does not look like the person who comes out. Police look closer at the image from the surveillance footage and they discover a yellow lidded container inside the plastic bag. This container belongs to what's believed to be a popular brand of antiseptic wipes that could be used to wipe down evidence from a crime scene. All the things we're looking at in this video indicate an extremely well-developed plan. After the coffee shop, the mystery woman goes to a big box store and appears to discard items in an outdoor garbage can. She's definitely acting strange in this video. Police notice that she's hiding behind some crates of manure and she puts her purse in her backpack. At 9.22, she heads to another big box store and goes to use the payphone. She pulls out a number on a piece of paper and dials. 23 minutes later, she leaves in a cab. All these snippets from surveillance video fit together like a puzzle. Her clothes are pre-packed and every stage of the journey appears to be related to something very specific that she does. This is obviously something she's planned out. Video of the journey of Todd's car comes in as well. Police find video from a gas station that appears to show Todd's Mustang traveling towards the Almond Grove about 8 a.m. 26 minutes later, it appears to be headed back to town. At 8.57, it passes by a gas station near to where it's abandoned by the mystery woman. A timeline is definitely coming together, and police are wondering if this whole gun show thing was just a ruse. And Todd just didn't want his wife to know where he was really going. To get inside his head, police have to consider the clues that they find at the crime scene. Here's a brutal slaying, a man shot point blank, with his wallet and shades beside him. But what about his cell phone? It's 40 feet away. Why? Is there something to be learned from that? What's behind that action? Maybe rage for something that can be found on the cell phone? The autopsy reveals that Todd had his hand up in a defensive move when the shot was fired at him. The bullet passed through his right hand and into the right side of his chest where it damaged multiple organs. The second bullet enters his chest and moves downwards where it hits his liver. Forensic detectives match the bullets to Todd's own 38 revolver which was found in his car. The cell phone provides both questions and clues for the police. They find what you'd expect, photos of his vacation, of his daughters, but there's also photos of a nude woman, and it's not his wife. Here's where the circumstances around a seemingly random murder change, and detectives see potential motives everywhere. Could the mysterious walking woman and the mysterious woman in Todd Chance's secret photos be one and the same? Police also find texts that lead them to believe there's a lot more to this family man than anyone appears to know. Todd sends a text to this woman. It says, want to play? What's going on with Todd? Is he living a double life? This is what the police have to find out. What's the identity of this mystery woman and who's behind this deadly game of catch me if you can? When a family man is shot dead, police put together a trail of surveillance videos and follow a mystery woman who flees after parking the victim's car. It even looks like she's planned to get his vehicle stolen to further cover her tracks. But when Todd's cell phone is found to hold nude images of a woman, police suspect maybe she and the mystery woman are one and the same. Since Todd's cell phone reveals explicit photos of an unknown woman and flirty texts, they feel like they should ask his wife if she had any idea that her husband was having an affair. But Janae is blindsided by this. 
She says she never checked Todd's phone or social media because she has always been secure in her relationship. She never saw this coming. Police track the identity of the woman from the photos. And she turns out to be Todd's first love, Carrie. Todd and Carrie have a well-established past as lovers. But because of the text that Todd sent saying, want to play, they want to know if Todd and Carrie now have a present. And were they planning on a future? Carrie admits that she did send graphic pictures to her ex-boyfriend, Todd. Carrie is Todd's first big love. They fall hard for each other. They see their future together all the way. But it's only five years later in 1995 that the couple are done. And it's only one short year later that Todd marries Janae, and boom, suddenly he's got a ready-made family. Suddenly, he's a stepdad and has a whole new life. Conceivably, that could shock Carrie, who probably imagined she'd be the one to have a family with Todd. Todd's parents say Todd won't talk about the breakup, which makes them wonder if there are bad feelings. Maybe Carrie harbors a grudge. Todd and Carrie run in the same social circle, and they see each other over the years at parties. There don't appear to be any issues, but recently things change. Carrie admits that after many years, in May 2012, she and Todd reunite over social media. She's now a single mom and a dental assistant. When Todd and Carrie connect, he asks if they can be, in his words, more than just Facebook friends. They exchange cell phone numbers and soon they're carrying on a relationship over text. Todd is the one who starts with the flirting, asking Carrie to come over to wash his car in her bikini. But she keeps Todd at bay. She texts back, yeah right, I don't need a crazy wife after me. In April of 2013, Todd asks for a good photo of Carrie. She satisfies his request by sending him a group of photos that would be considered X-rated a series of new photos of herself. The marital relations in the Chance household are not sounding so healthy to investigators. It looks possible that Todd is living a double life and that Janae doesn't know what he's up to while she's working hard at school. And there's always the possibility that Carrie has motive to be angry with Todd. Carrie claims to the police that she's never even seen Todd in person or spoken to him on the phone in all the time they were carrying on their relationship. And they've fallen out of touch. It's been five months since she sent him nude photos. The text messages between Todd and Carrie back up what Carrie says when Todd asks, you want to play? And she responds, no way, married man. Police still want to check out her alibi. After a thorough check of Carrie's activities, they were able to confirm that she was nowhere near where the murder occurred at the time. She even has witnesses, a parking ticket, and receipts to back up her alibi. And importantly, police see that the woman in the video doesn't look like Carrie. They don't move the same way. Police call Janae to come down to the station and pick up Todd's car. But the car has so many bad associations. She never wants to see it again. Janae asked Todd's father to come with her to the station and take the car away. All right, it'll be about five minutes, maybe three. And then we'll get everything together, okay? All right. The two are ushered into a room, but they quickly suspect that there's more to this interaction than they were led to believe. It doesn't seem like we're picking up a car. Seems like we're going to be interviewed. Janae offers her own theory of what could have happened to Todd. It was like gang related. They'll have these little 14 year olds that'll come and say they did it all to take the heat because they don't get in as much trouble. And they have to prove, they've got to figure out did they really do it or did they not? They're just trying to take the ball for something. Yeah, I've seen stuff like that on TV, but that's all I know about it. I can't imagine something happened like that to Todd. Janae seems to be interested in the contents of Todd's cell phone. I said, when am I going to get his phone back? Because there's like a missing link. There's like a piece of the puzzle that I can't put together. Man, it's just, it's just driving me up the wall. I lay down at night thinking about him. Wake up in the morning. Or in the middle of the night, whichever the case might be. <clears throat> the detectives show Todd's father the surveillance footage and ask if he recognizes the mystery woman. He doesn't. 
The detectives then show Janae the footage and ask if she recognizes the woman. Janae believes at first that she could be looking at the other woman, but gradually comes to realize that police are interrogating her. So what happens now? No, we need to know why. There's no why. You no, know, whether there is a why. There is a reason. You're not a cold-blooded killer. You're really not. I don't think you are. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me. You're wrong about everything. Tell me you didn't plan this for weeks. Janae feels she can prove that this mystery woman in the video isn't her. People say that's Janae. They look that doesn't make sense. That's that, Janae. I don't think that looks like me at all. For one thing, she's extremely vision impaired, and she would need glasses to be able to walk as confidently as this mystery woman. Janae doesn't own prescription sunglasses, and she believes the woman in the video is quite a bit heavier than she is. As well as not having any motive to kill her husband, Janae doesn't like to shoot guns, and she can't drive Todd's car because it's a standard transmission. I can't explain that. I can't either. The only way I explain it is you were in the car. That's I the was only not in the car. It's the what? only explanation. How do I today? prove myself that I was home? Despite everything she tells them, all of her reasons, police get increasingly insistent with her, so much so that she asks for an attorney. And it's at this point that something big happens. You're caught, okay? You're caught. You murdered your husband. You'll probably be on a TV show someday. I'm refusing to talk to you because you are yelling at me. Explain that to me. So, okay, I want a lawyer. There we go. Will I get rid of you? Because yes. I am not going to respond to you. Okay. It's because you're a murderer. No. Yes. You're under arrest for murder. Police arrest Leslie Janae Chance on the spot for the murder of Todd Chance. Detectives have suspected her all along. They feel that when they first told her about the fact that Todd had been murdered, her reaction was not consistent with what they would expect to see in a spouse having been told that news. And to police, her reaction to their video surveillance footage is off as well. With Janae in custody, police do a search of the Chance House and seize the electronics. The whole family is in a state of shock. Not only has Todd been murdered, but the three daughters have the remaining parent taken from them and accused of killing their dad. In jail, as Janae waits for her arraignment, she worries about her girls. Her glasses are taken from her. She doesn't use contacts. So she won't even be able to give her children a look of reassurance in court. But four days later, the DA has declined to prosecute, citing the fact that the video footage wasn't sufficient evidence. They made an arrest too early. They didn't have what they needed to convince the DA's office that this case ought to go forward. So Janae was free to go. Investigators have jumped the gun here. Janae is relieved and prays that police will now put their efforts into finding the real killer. But detectives still believe Janae is guilty. They haven't given up, and they believe that she is really the only one with a motive. Jealousy. Although Janae claims not to know about Todd's attempt to start an affair with Carrie, police suspect that she's lying. Jealousy, anger would not be inappropriate emotions. Janae was cheated on before she met Todd. She was very careful when she got to know Todd Chance. She said she never wanted to be with another player. The search of the Chance household reveals several life insurance policies, adding up to close to half a million dollars. Janae isn't unnerved by the revelation. She says these are standard policies taken out eight to ten years before. Besides, she earns six figures. She hardly needs to kill someone for money. Years pass and there are theories and questions about Todd's death and the mystery woman's identity but there's no proof of anything. In that time, Todd's parents come to believe the suspicions of police. They think Janae has killed their son. The grandparents hire a lawyer and they're able to contest one of the life insurance policies so that the money goes to their grandchildren, not Janae. But this causes a big rift in the family. Janae loses over half her body weight over the next three years and gains a new confidence. Perhaps she's finding a way to start over. But the detective on this case keeps going over the file. He strongly believes that there is a clue buried in this pile somewhere that could put all these threads together. 
he finds what he's looking for in a summer vacation photo that was taken before Todd's death. The family is in a fake police lineup photo from the CSI Experience Exhibit in Las Vegas. Then the detective realizes he needs to know exactly what information this crime scene experience consists of. And the detective jumps on a plane to Vegas. And what does he find? There are three crime scene scenarios, one of which involves a woman who kills her husband and drops the body in the desert. Now for the detective, the clues start to fit together like that puzzle. And he's hot on the trail of his prime suspect again. The detectives find one fingerprint on Todd's car. They didn't have enough video surveillance, but more has accumulated. Why is she caught on film holding the very gun that kills Todd? The woman in the R-rated photos on Todd Chance's cell phone is found by police. But she has an alibi for the day of his murder. The DA believes the surveillance video detectives have gathered is not enough to prove Todd Chance's wife, Janae, is guilty. It's a crazy hunch, but when one detective takes a closer look at the family's vacation photos, he noticed that they were at a CSI exhibit in Las Vegas. He decides to go to this exhibit and see exactly what the chances would have found out about crime scenes. The CSI experience in Vegas promises to get ordinary people thinking like crime scene investigators. It takes you through every element of a crime scene experience in a very hands-on, immersive way. With one of the scenarios being a wife who kills her husband and leaves the body in the desert, the detective is understandably curious about just what a visitor could learn. What we learn about a crime scene from this exhibit could be for a perpetrator to use a payphone and not a cell phone. You'd learn to change your shoes and clothes, which the suspect did in the coffee shop. You'd learn to wipe down the crime scene with antiseptic wipes, much like the ones that were believed to have been in the plastic bag in the coffee shop. And Todd's car was wiped almost completely clean of fingerprints. There's another photo that stands out for the detective from the big summer holiday. The family are all shooting Todd's gun, even Janae, who purports to hate guns. So why? The detective wonders, is she caught on film holding the very gun that kills Todd? They didn't have enough video surveillance evidence the first time, but more has certainly accumulated since then. We last saw the mystery woman get into a cab, and in what police believe is her image, again, she gets dropped off at a big box store just a mile from the Chance household. And again, she emerges from that location, having changed her clothes, and she leaves. At 10.10 10 a.m., the figure is seen even closer to the Chance household, running. And moments later, right around the corner from the Chances, the figure is picked up yet again on surveillance video. Along with the additional surveillance video, the detectives find one fingerprint on Todd's car. It's on the driver's side door, and it's Janae's. They also find her DNA on the steering wheel and the gear shift. This makes absolutely no sense if, as Janae said, she never drives Todd's car. DNA evidence can be found from even the most innocuous of things. The sweat and oil from palms left on items you've touched can, under the right circumstances, be enough to track a person. Janae's daughters indicate that she was up early on Sunday morning working. But the laptop is sent to the FBI crime lab, where it's determined that no key was touched until after 11 a.m. The detective has dug deep and found even more compelling video taken before the murder. One week before Todd's murder, Weaver finds that Janae purchases something at the big box store where the mystery woman used a payphone to call a cab. There is video of Janae walking up to the store greeter and making what appeared to be a phone gesture. The greeter pointed her in the direction of a payphone. It was later she made a purchase there and left. Police know Janae has a work cell and a personal cell. So why would she need to know where the payphone is located in the big box store? The same store where the suspect makes a phone call the day Todd Chance was shot. 
This may just be circumstantial, but the detectives have worked hard to bring everything together for the DA. But will this be enough? On December 1st, 2016, three years after her first arrest, Janae is pulled over by police as she leaves work. At first, it appears to be for a traffic violation, but the detective is very familiar to her. He arrests Janae Chance and charges her with first-degree murder again. The CSI crime scene experience in Vegas offers many valuable lessons that the killer of Todd Chance could have learned, like using a payphone instead of a cell phone. And a week before the murder, Janae Chance appears to be asking the location of the payphone at the same big box store the mystery woman is tracked to. Janae is arrested again, but is there enough evidence this time to try her in court for murder? The day of Janae's arrest, detectives bring her eldest daughter in for questioning. When you showed up, what was your name? Usually, Audrey. I even asked her what time it was. What'd she tell you? She said he was at the gun show with his dad. Is there anything else that went on that day that you told me on? No. How about your mom? Was she reacting the way you would think a wife would react? Yeah. She got told that her husband was murdered. Five late afternoon, she was trying to get away from his car, his guns, and anything that would actually be personal property in the house. So I've seen all kinds of grief. But this, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen a wife begin to give her husband stuff away for her to be murdered. Detectives then show her the surveillance videos from the day of the murder. It looked like Tom Mustard. Yeah. Impossible. Next, they show her the video of the suspect walking through the neighborhood after ditching Todd's car. Recognize the walk. That's not good enough to make a, a facial identification. But does the walk matter? Jessica spots something that she does seem to recognize. Do you have that backpack? Because I'm telling you, if it was the backpack that I think it is very distinctive, it was a very old. After she watches all the material, the detectives ask her a question. Which one? explain this whole thing to me. First of all, is that your mother? Yes. Is that your mother in all the videos? I believe so. Let me tell you why this one here is important. She's also shown the video from a week before the murder. This is the greater Richard. But later, Jessica believes because she's shown all the videos together, she's unfairly led down a path to surmise all the videos are her mother. The red backpack that at first seems distinctive is later called common. The daughters stay loyal to their mother. On December 9th, 2019, Leslie Janae Chance faced a jury of 12 Kern County residents in Kern County Superior Court. The defense argues that the lead detective made up his mind early on that Janae was guilty, so much so that his investigation is incredible. Janae's daughters can give her an alibi as early as 9.30 a.m. Several people are shown the surveillance video and did not recognize Janae as the mystery woman. However, this was not logged into evidence. Prosecutors argue that Janae murders her husband after she comes upon the sexually explicit texts. She makes a lot more money than Todd, so in a divorce, she has to pay him alimony. This is a perceived motive. They describe to the jury how the Vegas CSI experience is really like murder school. And Janae, the teacher and school principal, learned her lesson and made a detailed plan to murder her husband. 
There are all kinds of family pictures in Janae's work office, but not one of Todd. Prosecution makes a case that she has ceased to love her husband. The forensic pathologist who performs the autopsy in 2013 takes the stand. He says it takes Todd less than 10 minutes to die. Todd is shot from only inches away by his own 38 revolver. The detectives believe that Todd was shot in his car, but there's no way to tell what position he was in. Prosecution claims that the woman in the video walks just like Janae. The key eyewitness sees Todd pull away from the home the morning he is killed, and there's a woman in the passenger seat wearing a hat and sunglasses, which makes it plausible to believe that the mystery woman is Janae. But the defense says it's not plausible for Janae to be able to get into the car while it's in the garage. And furthermore, Todd didn't allow anyone to get into the car while it was in the garage. Janae takes the stand and testifies over several days. Janae says she can't possibly be the mystery woman because her eyes are so bad she can't navigate the streets without her glasses. She also doesn't own contacts or prescription sunglasses. There is a lot of evidence that could be perceived as circumstantial, so really it's anybody's guess how this trial is going to go. The lead detective delays his retirement to see the case through. He's convinced she's guilty and prays that she'll be caught in a lie. And then something critical comes to light. All the way along, Janae has made a big point about her poor eyesight. She's really stressed it. However, there's a big revelation coming in the trial. Police have discovered that in July 2013, one month before her husband's murder, Janae purchased two boxes of contacts. The jury deliberates for eight days. Janae is confident and her daughters stock her favorite ice cream ready for her to come home. After a four and a half week trial on September 16, 2020, Janae is found guilty of first degree murder. She gets 25 years to life in prison with an additional 25 years for a firearms enhancement. Janae Chance's defense attorney tries to get a new trial, but all motions are dismissed. Todd's parents are keenly aware that there are no winners here. Their son is dead and their family is divided. Their granddaughters stand firmly with their mother. A self-made millionaire with a wonderful family. A very exclusive neighborhood. A lawsuit with millions of dollars at stake. We immediately learned that Bill McLaughlin had been in this very contentious lawsuit with his former business partner. A shocking and bloody event that no one sees coming. Leaves authorities baffled and friends and family terrified. So the suspect had keys to the place, entered, shot him immediately, and exited immediately. So it was an execution. Newport Beach is in Orange County, California, and is one of the wealthiest cities in the nation. Newport Beach is a coastal city. It has a lot of really nice homes overlooking the beach. Newport Beach is very affluent, but it's this really weird, kind of cool, eclectic mixture of wealthy people and broke surfers. It's high-end. A lot of prominent people live there. A lot of people with money live there. And Bill McLaughlin, he was one of those people. He was a multimillionaire and was living right on the bay in the Newport area. 
He is the kind of life that most people dream of, but even the most beautiful dream can turn into a nightmare. On December 15, 1994, at 9.11 p.m., a call is placed to 911. Newport Beach Emergency, please fire a paramedic. What's the problem there? What can you do, please, for, sir? I can't understand what you're saying. The call is coming from Bill McLaughlin's home, and the caller is his son, Kevin. There's this heart-wrenching 911 call where he's trying to describe to the 911 operator that his father has been shot. He had some uh, physical difficulties from an accident that he was involved in. He didn't speak well. Your dad? Okay, we have an officer on the way to your house right now. Kevin McLaughlin was skateboarding home one night and he got hit by a drunk driver. The accident resulted in substantial brain damage to Kevin. So he goes from being this super athletic surfer kid to having a major disability because of this accident. Is there anybody out there that could talk to me? You're the only one that can talk to me? Okay, is it your, is your father or your dog? Your father. Okay, we should have an officer there any minute now. Emergency personnel arrive and find Bill McLaughlin lying in a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. He is dead. Police walked in and, uh, and immediately went to work. So Bill McLaughlin is on his back in the kitchen. He's got six gunshot wounds. He's been shot multiple times in his own home in one of the safest neighborhoods in the country. Who would have done that? And more importantly, why? 54-year-old William Bill McLaughlin is born in Southern California in 1939. He studies biological engineering in college. After he graduates, he gets a job selling medical supply equipment. In 1975, Bill invents a new kind of dialysis catheter. Bill McLaughlin was essentially an executive that got together with, with a partner of his in the pharmaceutical business, and they invented a way to separate plasma from blood. And this man um, and Bill essentially partnered up and sold this technology to a major pharmaceutical company. It's a groundbreaking invention and one that's still in use today. When he sells it, it makes him a multimillionaire. Bill, his wife, and his three kids move into a house in Newport Beach. It's in a gated community called Balboa Coves. You know you're doing well when you can afford a house there until his wife files for divorce in 1990. Bill McLaughlin had been married for over 30 years. He had uh, two daughters and a son. And, you know, it's one of those things where the marriage just kind of sputtered out. There was no great drama. It's never easy going through a divorce, especially when you have kids involved. But all that said, Bill seems to come through it okay. He maintains a good relationship with his kids, and he certainly keeps busy. He regularly flies his private plane to Las Vegas, where he has a vacation home. On Thursday, December 15th, 1994, Bill flies home from Las Vegas, as he's done many times before. Bill McLaughlin was home with his son. His son was not supposed to be home. He was supposed to be in a meeting, but he was not. He did not go to the meeting, so he was there, and they probably had something to eat. The son went upstairs to listen to some music, and Bill was downstairs uh, at his table in the kitchen, or near the kitchen. Bill is going over some legal documents. Documents uh, related to a lawsuit that he'd been involved in with his former business partner. And that's when all of a sudden somebody came through the front door, which originally was locked, and uh, came through and shot him six times while he was in his kitchen. Kevin was upstairs listening to music, and he heard a series of gunshots downstairs. And he, he came downstairs, and he saw his father dying on the kitchen floor. And he immediately dialed 911 and tried his best to communicate with his voice problems that he had to the 911 operator of the police department and tell them his dad was shot. Your son? 
Where is the gun? Where is the gun right now? You don't know? Do you think he shot himself? Mr. McLaughlin was in the kitchen on his back. He had bullet holes in him, six of them. Uh, there were bullet casings from a semi-automatic handgun would eject the uh, casing, and they were six of those around on the floor, and he was dead. The rounds were determined to be a, a type of ammunition called federal hydroshock, which is, um, it's a vicious, it's a vicious round. Essentially, it expands inside the human body. The only other person in the house at the time of the murder is Kevin. It's clear he's not a serious suspect, but police still have to clear him, and they do pretty quickly. When the police got there and looked at this scene, it really did look like it was a planned murder because the person came in, the person had keys to get in the front door, had two keys, one for the bolt lock and one for the regular lock, and one was still in the, the keyhole and the other one was down on the floor. The one that was stuck in the front door was a freshly cut Ace Hardware key, and the one on the mat was an original community access gate key. So the suspect had keys to the place, entered, shot him immediately, and exited immediately. So it was uh, an execution. No forced entry, no sign of a struggle, and nothing was taken from the home. This rules out a robbery gone wrong, but who would want Bill McLaughlin dead? Investigators discover that Bill's former business partner believed that Bill owes him millions of dollars, and the two have been battling in court. It appears that Bill is going over documents about this lawsuit when he's attacked in his kitchen. That's a motive. Uh, whether or not that person had anything to do with the murder or something the detectives needed to, needed to find out right away. Uh, that was of interest to them. They certainly took a look at the partner. Bill had just essentially won the lawsuit. The court came out with an indicated ruling that was going to free up about $12 million to Bill McLaughlin. The ex-partner has a solid alibi, so is ruled out fairly quickly. Bill was divorced at the time of this incident. An ex-wife might be a logical suspect if the divorce is still in progress, but Bill and Susan have been divorced for years. Divorce can bring out the worst in people, especially when custody of children is an issue. But their youngest child is 26. It doesn't seem like his ex-wife would have much to gain. Investigators are still working at the scene when a woman named Nanette Johnston shows up. There was a point in the investigation, about probably an hour and a half into it maybe, when Nanette arrived home. She lived at that house, and she had been shopping uh, in the, uh, one of the nearby malls and arrived home to see all the police tape and all the police cars, and they interviewed her outside the house. They don't know who she is. She has to explain to the police that she's Bill's fiance and that she lives in the house with them. She's already figured out that there's something wrong, but she's shocked to discover that Bill is dead. Do you have any idea why this could happen to you? I have no idea. I wish I had something to tell you. I wish I knew. I don't know. I don't, I can't think of anybody. They interviewed Nanette quite in detail. She had been up at a soccer game with her son and her daughter. Went to the store before coming home. What were your activities today? I picked up some stuff from my son at a soccer game in Diamond Bar. And so I went up there. She planned to be with Bill that night. She knew that he was home that night and hadn't seen him for a few days because he had taken a trip to Las Vegas and had recently flown back and arrived that afternoon while she was at the soccer game. They find a note from Nanette telling Bill that she's at the game and will be home later. So she was very worried, especially when she found out that there were keys that were left at the scene, that somebody knew and it got the keys to get into the house in order to kill Bill. And she made mention that she was supposed to be home at that time. That scared her. And she said that she was afraid that maybe she was the target and she just wasn't home. So she was very concerned. Since the investigation will be continuing all night, Nanette can't stay at the house. Luckily, Bill owns another house nearby on the beach. She tells the police that she'll stay there. As a matter of routine, Investigators try to verify Nanette's story. They talk to her ex-husband, who confirms that she is at a soccer game with her son. But then, he drops a bombshell. He told the police, you know, she told me not to mention this, but she was there with her boyfriend. 
And that kind of surprised the police because they thought that she didn't have a boyfriend. They thought that she was a fiancé to the victim. Newport Beach, California, is home to many wealthy and prominent citizens. Balboa Coves is a gated community located just off the coast highway and right on the waterfront. It's where Bill McLaughlin lives until his life is unexpectedly and brutally cut short on December 15, 1994. It's also where Bill's fiance, Nanette Johnston, lives. Police find out that Nanette has a secret boyfriend. While she was engaged to marry Bill, they want to find out more about this guy. So they decided to stake out Nanette's second house, the one that's on the beach, to see if this other guy, Eric, would arrive. Eric actually arrived the, the day that they were watching. It was uh, sometime at night. Uh, he did arrive at that location, and they ended up actually doing a car stop on him and talking to him, and they found out who he was. The police asked him, you know, what's your relationship in, with Nanette? And he said, well, we're friends. We're pretty good friends. They discovered that he did have a, a small warrant for his arrest, a traffic warrant of some sort. And so they actually took him into custody for that warrant and then interviewed him in, in extent regarding this case. Eric Napuski is an ex-football player. He played in the NFL for a few different teams and also played in Spain and in Canada, but his entire career only lasted for a few years. Okay, I'm now looking at working now. I'm still in security. I'm just security work. I'm just helping out the nightclub because they have a problem with controlling things down there. The last one was shut down. He's working as a bouncer at a bar. And this particular bar is only a block away from Bill's house. They ask him if he ever uses guns. Hey, uh, do you have a CCW? No. Okay, do you do any army? No, I don't do any army. Not you got any uniform? No. no. I don't even have a sign on that takes that takes at least six months. They asked him if he owned guns. He originally said no, he didn't. And then the interview goes on for probably another forty five minutes and they circle back. Okay, you said you don't bone any firearms at all. No, I, I bought one. Um, I haven't seen it for so long. I uh, bought one in Dallas that I gave my dad as a 380. So first it's no guns, and then it's one. Eventually, though, they came to a point where he did admit that he had a Beretta 92F 9mm gun, but he had given it some time ago to one of his employees at a scene and that guy had lost it. So that was like months ago. He keeps changing his story. One minute he's no guns at all and now he's, well, I did have a 380, but I gave it to my dad and I gave a Beretta 9mm to my employee. Now I don't have either of them. When the police officers actually contacted the employee that supposedly had the Beretta, uh, he said, no, I was never given a Beretta. It was a piece of crap Jennings 380, and Eric never paid me for the job, so I told Eric that the gun got stolen out of my car. And uh, he was eventually was able to get that 380 semi-automatic gun and give it to the police, so it was not the Beretta. He says his dad has the 380, but his employee has it? Or are there two 380s? Where is the Beretta he says he owns, and why does he claim it's missing? When this was going down, they were doing the ballistic testing on the bullets at the crime scene, and they discovered that the bullets that were there had been fired by one of 27 guns. One of those 27 guns was a Beretta 92F. So when they heard about this Beretta being possibly belonging to Eric, they definitely were interested in finding out where that gun was, since Eric told them, he gave it to this employee, and that wasn't true. They then questioned Eric a lot about where that gun was. During his second interview with police, Eric is more defensive. Where is your 9 I have no idea. You have no idea? That's my statement. I don't want to know what you're talking about. about that, dude. You anymore. Anymore. The last time I saw it? I don't want to talk you don't anymore. No. This is the No matter what happened to any guns, any time, anywhere, I didn't do anything wrong with anything, okay? That's my statement. 
One of the things that's interesting about Naposky is he is he's incredibly forceful as he tells his story and convincing. Nanette's a pretty good friend of mine. He describes a dating relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, I would say dating, dating relationship. And it starts out, she's a girl I know, to basically the end of the interview, they learn that they're dating. Benny admits to maybe a little more. Girlfriend can mean a lot of things. I mean, do you think this is headed towards a serious relationship, a marriage? I hope it is. I hope it is, yeah. By the end of the first interview, he admits that he hoped to marry her. While looking into Bill's financial affairs, investigators discover some missing money. They got into the finances and they started to discover that there was money missing from some of his accounts and they discovered that Nanette was taking small bits of money about a year earlier throughout the whole year of 1994 as it gained closer and closer to December more and more money was being taken out of Bill's accounts and disappearing. As a matter of fact, the day before he was murdered, Nanette got a check from him for $250,000 with a signature that was determined not to be Bill's, even though it looks similar to it. It comes out in the investigation that Nanette and Eric frequently travel together. In the weeks leading up to Bill McLaughlin's murder, Nanette's sister got married on the East Coast, and she did not bring Bill McLaughlin as her date. She brought Eric Naposky as her date. This doesn't seem to mesh with her plans to marry Bill. Does one of them decide that they need to get Bill out of the way? Well, they had suspicions, absolutely. And they brought those suspicions, but they just did not have enough to get over the hump to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They needed more than what they had at that time. But they do have enough to charge Nanette with grand theft for stealing close to $500,000 from Bill. She pleads guilty and goes to jail for less than a year. And Bill McLaughlin's murder case goes stone cold. Bill McLaughlin is murdered in his own kitchen. Police suspect his fiance, Nanette, and her boyfriend, Eric, but can't prove it. Nanette is convicted of stealing some of Bill's money and spends a year in prison. The murder case goes cold. My name is Larry Montgomery. I've uh, been a police detective at the Irvine Police Department for most of my 29 years that I was at Irvine PD. And then I retired and went to the Orange County District Attorney's Office and was an investigator for them for about 14 years. And during that time, I was allowed to go into a cold case unit. It's 2008, 14 years since Bill McLaughlin's murder, and Larry Montgomery is assigned to the case. It was a brand new unit for me to be in, and I was kind of like, well, what do I do with a cold case? What do I do to make a difference that the other detectives hadn't done, maybe? One of my advantages was I had time. I didn't have a caseload. I could take this case and do whatever I wanted and take as long as I wanted. When a case has gone unsolved for 14 years, another year or two can make all the difference. Better to take it slow and get it right. So what I did is I had, that particular case, I think there was 63 tape-recorded interviews on cassette tapes. That's a lot of interviews. It was hours and hours and hours and uh, uh, hundreds of hours, basically. So I sat down and I started going through the tapes and taking copious notes on everything on all those tapes. Working a cold case is a lot like being an investigative journalist. You look for things that don't make sense, that don't add up, that raise a few questions. And then you dig deeper. And S behavior on the night of the murder is one of those things. So you look at what she said when she's at home, when she comes home that day, she's mortified that her fiance has been murdered. She knows that the killer brought keys had keys to this house. How did the killer get keys to this house? And then at the end, she goes, I'm not going to stay here. Don't worry. I'm not, you know, I know you have a day's worth of work to do here, but I'll go to our other place. The locks had not been changed on the beach house. She knows there's a killer on the loose with a key to one of the houses. Why wouldn't the killer have keys to both houses? Why would you even risk going there? Why would you even consider going there? She's brought her children to a place where a killer might show up and she didn't even draw the curtains. And here's Nanette 
with a Christmas tree and her two little kids putting stuff on the Christmas tree. Okay, how scared is Nanette of the killer? She's in a place blocks from where the murder was. Who knows how the murderer got keys to that house? Does he have keys to this house? Was she the target? She said, I, I could have been the target. I've pissed off people in my life. So is she really afraid that she's the target? She's right there in the full view of anybody on the beach. Matter of fact, there's a man with a gun right outside. It's a police officer, and she doesn't know that he's even out there. They're police officers. They're detectives. They know how to operate a firearm standing on the sand outside the beach house, and she didn't even draw the curtains and didn't know they were there, which means her head is not on a swivel. She's not looking around for who, who this might be. Did she change the locks? She didn't do that. She didn't have security. She didn't have even Naposky move in with her to protect her from the killer. She goes to this place and is, doesn't have a care in the world. She's not looking out the window that the guy's going to get her. So that shows that she's not afraid of the killer. Otherwise, she wouldn't be there. Investigators get the sense that Nanette first became interested in Bill because of his money. What we discovered while investigating the case, Nanette had put an ad in a, back then it was a, a picture, like magazine, newspaper type material, and it had her in a negligee, kind of kneeling down on a bed. So it's a boudoir photo of her in negligee saying, I know how to take care of my man if he knows how to take care of me. And it's entitled Wealthy Men Only. And it appears that was the ad that uh, attracted Bill's attention. Nanette also stands to inherit money because of Bill's death. In addition to the money she's convicted of stealing, there's a bequest in the will and a life insurance policy. Regardless of guilt or innocence, Eric and Nanette do not get married and live happily ever after. His talk of love seems authentic, and his intentions to marry her are clear. He even writes a note in his book on January 1st, 1994, with the word propose, spelled wrong, but we know what he means. And she actually went and found another millionaire and married that guy, kind of dumped Eric, even though they were together for a while, but I don't think she really wanted Eric around. And um, so they did separate, and they went their separate ways. They embarked on this very lavish lifestyle. Now, the thing about Nanette, she's all about money, right? So Eric Naposky had fulfilled his usefulness. They broke up because she has no real interest in some broke, washed-up football player. Eric, after the murder at some point, I think he went up to the Canadian Football League for a little while. He wound up in Spain playing for the Barcelona Dragons, had a great season. You know, but it's kind of like being the home run king of the minor league team, you know, it's, he, he didn't make any real money. He meets a woman there, and they have a couple of kids. Back in the U.S., he does some coaching at the University of New Haven, goes back into security work, and then opens his own gym. Nanette not only finds herself another wealthy businessman to marry, she does it twice. She winds up getting married to a guy named Packard, uh, who uh, my understanding is he made a bunch of money in real estate, and then they got divorced, and then um, went up remarrying to a guy named Billy McNeil. So she went off and lived this very lavish, um, sort of quintessential Newport Beach housewife, um, Orange County, I and mean, we've all seen the show, right? And she has another kid with each of them. It's now 15 years after the murder of Bill McLaughlin, and Larry gets his first big break when he stumbles onto something interesting at the end of one of the 63 tapes made all those years ago. Larry Montgomery, just he, he's incredible. He, he went through all the old tip logs of people who called in and he listened to the end of every tape. And it was a woman who was saying, yeah, you know, we were watching the news and we saw that Nanette Johnston ripped off this guy and was sent to jail. We just wanted you guys to know that uh, my husband uh, had a dealings with Nanette. Um, she came over to our house one day and was interested in maybe investing in my husband's company and uh, was willing to invest maybe two hundred or maybe a hundred thousand dollars in the company, but she wouldn't have the money till after the first of the year. Where does Nanette think that money is coming from? She's got no job. She's got no stocks. She has no sort of financial portfolio. The only way Nanette winds up flush with cash after the first of the year is if Bill McLaughlin dies. The woman wants to remain anonymous, and the call is abruptly cut off. No one tries to follow up at the time. I heard 
with really good earphones, I could hear her in the background say, Robert, they want to talk to you. It's not much to go on, but if Larry can find this Robert, it just might be the key to finding out what really happened to Bill McLaughlin 15 years ago. In 2008, cold case investigator Larry Montgomery begins looking into the 1994 murder of Bill McLaughlin. He discovers that an anonymous woman phones police with a tip about Nanette having suspicious dealings with her husband, a man named Robert. So all of a sudden it's like, this is interesting. Okay, I would love to know uh, who this guy is, but all we had was the type of company he had, which was biomedics, I think, and uh, he lived in Irvine, and his name was Robert. That's really all we had. Oh, he went to the gym with her. And we know what gym she went to. So we went to the gym to see if we could find anybody with the name Robert in there. We found some Roberts, but we didn't find any that matched him. A thorough search in Irvine fails to yield any Roberts with a business license for a biomedical company. There are these books that they have that are called crisscross directories. In a crisscross directory, phone numbers are listed by numerical order rather than by name. You could look up a number and then find who belonged to that number instead of looking up a name and finding the phone number. So it was a reverse book. So I went there to look and see what numbers the net was calling and who she was calling. And there were two numbers that I could not find in those books. I almost left and then I started realizing, well, this was December, so maybe I should be looking at 95 because maybe it's a new phone number in the in 94 somewhere. So I went back inside, went back and got 95 book, looked for those two numbers, and lo and behold, one of those numbers popped up and it belonged to Robert. We located that person. We found out that he was, in fact, the right person. This is years and years later. And at that point, he was willing to talk with us. And he laid it all out to us. So he's now a new witness. And so that was one of our needed pieces of evidence so that we could file charges. Larry locates another witness from the past. During the initial investigation, a woman calls police and offers some information about Eric, but because she insists on remaining anonymous, they disregard what she has to say. So that was a person that I re-looked for years later, and I was able to find her and go talk with her, and she was able to open up to me and then agreeable to talk with us about everything that she knew back then in great detail. In 1994, Eric lives in an apartment complex, and he has a friend there named Susan. They used to talk to each other while they were lying next to the pool. But he was talking to her about his girlfriend, who he wanted to marry, and how his girlfriend was having a problem. She lived with a, uh, a rich man that was abusing her, sexually assaulting her. And he was very angry about this fact that his girlfriend was being sexually assaulted by this rich guy from Newport. Interestingly enough, he tells Susan that he wants to blow up the rich guy's plane, but she doesn't think much of it. She thinks it's just an angry guy talking. That is, until January, when she bumps into Eric and he tells her that the guy is dead. And she goes, oh my God, Eric, please tell me you didn't do that. And he kind of chuckled and said, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, maybe I paid somebody to do it. She checks the newspapers, and the story about Bill's murder is everywhere. And she did call the police anonymously at first and just said, I wanted to tell you this information, but she was afraid that she would get killed by Naposky. So she gave them some information, but it wasn't enough for them to go uh, do anything with because she wasn't identifying herself totally. You can't blame her for being afraid. So that was another witness that we had that we were now able to get more information from, new information that helped us put the case together. So we've got these, these just gems of evidence that we were able to develop in the two years that we worked the case up that really, I think, made it overwhelming. Ballistics takes another look at the bullets that killed Bill. In this case, back in uh, 1994, the lab said that the bullets that killed Bill McLaughlin were shot by one of 27 guns. Ballistics had changed over the years, and they were able to determine that it's actually one of two guns could have shot these bullets, not one of 27. And lo and behold, one of those guns was a Beretta 92F. So given the interviews, um, that was hugely significant because we know Eric Naposky not only had a Beretta 92F, 
but he lied to the police multiple times about what happened to it. So that was big. March of 2009 is when we finally got enough put together that we could arrest them. And so what we chose to do was we thought that Nanette is the brains of this outfit. She had orchestrated it. She got Eric to kill for her. Uh, that's what we believed happened. And Eric was kind of uh, duped into it. Uh, he thought she was, he was going to marry Nanette, and Nanette did not marry him. He, once he did his job and killed, she basically tried to get rid of him. And so we were monitoring her, and what we wanted to do was get Eric into custody. We wanted to give Eric Naposky a chance to sign on with the good guys. We actually set up two teams, and the, the plan was one team would go and arrest uh, Naposky in Connecticut, take him to a police department, and put in what's called a cold call, to Nanette Johnson and see if he'd be willing to help the police nail her down and get her to make some sort of admission. He was not interested in that at all. He said he didn't do it, she didn't do it, this is all bull, and so he would not participate in that whatsoever. So we were disappointed in that because we thought that would be a good way to get Nanette. If Eric won't come clean and testify against Nanette, do investigators have enough to convict either of them? Cold case investigators amass enough new evidence to arrest Eric Naposky for the murder of Bill McLaughlin. They're hoping to turn Eric on his suspected accomplice, Nanette, and get his help to incriminate her. He refuses. Even though they mostly have circumstantial evidence, they go ahead and arrest Nanette anyway. They're still hoping that Eric will come to his senses and testify against her. On June 19, 2011, Eric goes on trial for the murder of Bill McLaughlin. By putting him on trial first, they're hoping to wear him down and show him how much trouble he's in. They want him to cut a deal. The prosecution reveals that Bill was shot six times in a special pattern. And then it was a bang, 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 bang. So it was six shots, but in successions of two. That's a close combat shooting technique that people are trained to do. It's essentially you shoot twice, you re-aim, you shoot twice, you re-aim, you shoot twice. Turns out Eric Naposky had had formal firearms training where the instructor went through that technique within six months of the murder. The killer has keys to the front door and gate of Bill's house. The owner of a hardware store testifies that a month or two before the murder, he made some keys for Eric. He thinks that he could have possibly made the key that was found in the front door. Not only did he get two keys cut in my store, but he also asked if I could make a silencer for a 9mm pistol. And we call that a clue. Eric claims that on his way to work on the night of the murder, he gets a page from one of his managers at the nightclub. I believe I was in my truck at the time. I went to a phone and I called him. I was in my truck. A pay phone? Uh-huh. I went to a pay phone and made the call. I know. How about we go look at my phone bill and see what time exactly I made that call? Maybe then, if I made the call at a certain time, you guys could leave me alone. Defense claims Eric uses a calling card at precisely 8.52 p.m making it impossible for him to get to the house and shoot Bill by the time of death at 9.11 p.m. The only problem is that in the 15 years since the murder, Eric has lost proof of this phone call. The company is out of business and there are no records. The prosecution is able to prove that Eric was able to get from where he claims he made the phone call to the site of the murder in time for him to do it. One of the things that we did is we we drove that over and over and over again. We, we drove it um, on the calendar anniversary of it. We drove it on, we, we did every incarnation of that drive, assuming that Eric Naposky was correct. No matter how you slice or dice that drive, there's plenty of time for Eric Naposky to have committed that murder. A person could walk from the bar where Eric worked to Bill's house in exactly two minutes and 32 seconds. It's 136 yards. You can hit it with an eight iron in the game of golf. I mean, it's right across the channel. So Eric Naposky has himself driving directly to the murder scene before the murder. Whether he stops to make a call or not is irrelevant. 
According to the prosecution's version of events, Eric arrives at the house and uses the keys he cut to unlock the gate and the front door. He uses the gun he bought and lied about to shoot Bill in three two-shot bursts, thanks to his security guard training. Then he walks to work in two minutes and 32 seconds. Eric chooses not to testify in his own defense. On July 14, 2011, Eric Naposky is found guilty of murder. Eric isn't sentenced right away because prosecutors are still hoping that he'll testify against Nanette. In January 2012, Nanette's trial begins. The prosecution paints a picture of a younger woman who gets involved with an older rich man and then conspires with her boyfriend to murder him for financial gain. Bill has made Nanette the beneficiary of a million dollar life insurance policy. He also appointed her as the trustee over the bulk of his estate. He made a will leaving her $150,000, a car, and the use of a beach house which she was able to stay in for up to a year after his death. Defense points out that Bill is worth over $20 million, and therefore more valuable to Nanette alive than dead. Bill's accountant testifies about Nanette stealing from Bill. As she steals more and more money and the amounts get larger, she runs a greater risk of being caught. The problem is that Nanette was about to be on the street with nothing because Bill McLaughlin was going to find out about Eric Naposky or Bill McLaughlin was going to find out about the thefts. Nanette's ex-husband takes the stand. He characterizes Nanette as a habitual liar. He says that she claims that she graduated from Arizona State, but he doesn't think she even graduated from high school. She cheats on him throughout the marriage, even leaving a note on a rich guy's car hoping to date him. She brings one date to her son's soccer match, but then meets Eric at the game and goes home with him. On the night of the murder, Nanette and Eric leave the soccer game early because, quote, Eric has an appointment. An appointment? Isn't he on his way to work? She asks her ex to take care of the kids and cancels her weekend's visit with them, almost like she knows something is going to happen. She drops Eric off and then goes shopping. Why? She needs an alibi. Because she knows Eric's appointment is to go over to Bill's house, use the keys he had made to let himself in, and then shoot Bill with the Beretta he purchased. Nanette and Naposky and Nanette's two children took a trip back to Naposky's house, his parents' house, and actually stayed with them for almost a week. All four of them went to New York and saw the sights of New York, and then they went up to the north part of the United States and went to Nanette's sister's wedding. And they have pictures of the kids and Nanette and Naposky actually at this wedding. Bill was close to those kids. Those kids came over every other week and at his house, and he was close to them. He took them on his boat. He took them in his plane. They have pictures of him on the couch uh, with the kids in, under both arms. And yet those kids just spent uh, two weeks with Eric Naposky and her mom as if that's her boyfriend. That meant that those two kids could never come to Bill's house and see Bill alive again. Because if they did, they would say, oh, we had a great trip. We went with mommy's boyfriend and we went to these places in New York, and they couldn't have that happen, so those kids never could see Bill again. They either expect him to be dead soon, or they know they need to make it happen. Otherwise, Bill will dump her, and she'll lose all that money. And so those are the kind of things that, once you get those things and you present those in front of a jury, it's very powerful stuff. And what we did in the trials, at the end of the trials, we presented maybe seven or eight things that we found that were really powerful. We have like 60 of those things that we've found, and we give seven of them to the jury and then tell the jury to go back into the jury room and listen to those interviews again. Listen to them again, especially the suspect interviews, and I'll bet you you'll find more. There's a power to discovering things for yourself. It can be far more effective than being told. On January 23rd, 2012, after four hours of deliberation, the jury finds Nanette guilty of first-degree murder. She is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This was one of the first cold cases that I worked in the unit, and it was very fulfilling to realize 
that we could find evidence that we didn't find before because we didn't know to look. And I was very happy with the results of this one. Bill's daughters were there. It was a, a very emotional experience for them. Uh, they really thought that this there would never be justice in their father's case. And so it was uh, a very powerful for them. Their, their son, the one that had some physical problems, he had passed away. All they had left were the, the two daughters and they were um, very happy that eventually some justice was served. We're talking almost two decades after their father has been murdered for the most banal of all reasons, for money. So when the jury came back and turns out they were a good group, they got it, they followed the law, they followed the evidence, and they made the right decision. It's one of those things that makes you want to you know, keep being a prosecutor forever. After a long September day in 2003, it's just another night out with friends. But when you add a volatile love affair and a rash of violent home robberies in the area, ending in a brutal murder, Detectives are faced with a puzzling question. Who killed Michael DeHakis? He is the last person that anybody would want to murder. Situated in Pima County, Tucson is the second largest city in Arizona. Many refer to it as the oasis of the desert. Tucson is a great town. The metropolitan area is about a million people, but Tucson likes to think of itself as a small town. It's about a third the size of Phoenix, and it's the city that doesn't want to grow to be like Phoenix, so we're completely opposite as far as that goes. So it's very hometowny. Everybody seems to know each other, especially in the yoga community. The midtown area of Tucson Although crime is typically higher in this part of the city, it boasts a vibrant arts and restaurant district, as well as many of the city's top urban attractions. Midtown is where most Tucsonians eat, drink, shop, and play. We love our Mexican food. We love our festivals. Michael DeHakis is a guy living life on his own terms, and that's just the way he likes it. His home is in the Midtown region of Tucson. A lot of older homes there, quite a lot of traffic, not a particularly safe neighborhood. It's got its pockets of crime infested areas just like any other major city. Friday, September 28th, 2003 at 6 a.m. While walking her dog, a neighbor discovers Michael's body. She calls 911. The body was discovered on the front porch. She saw his body and saw that he clearly had some trauma. The neighbor calls police, telling them there is a body and a lot of blood on the porch of a house on North Sparkman Boulevard. On-duty officers are on the scene within minutes. We were called as a homicide team, I believe it was around 6 a.m. And when I arrived there, there were other officers on scene already, uniform officers. All I was told, it was a, a dead male, possible homicide victim laying on his porch outside his residence. We did a walkthrough and we found the victim 
Michael Dohakis laying there on his porch, face up, on his back, and a lot of dried blood around his head. His body was warm to touch. Uh, felt that he probably died within the last eight to 12 hours. The coroner identified his wound as a gunshot wound, did not find an exit wound, so the, the bullet was still in his head. It was clear to us that the victim had been shot by a handgun or a rifle. We weren't sure at the time. Our next step is to canvas the area, talk to neighbors, see if they heard anything, heard any gunshots things of that nature. Michael was a machinist by trade, so he had a workshop right outside his kitchen door. A neighbor across the street thought that Michael was alive on the day before. He heard, uh, he heard Michael's uh, compressor going on and off in his machine shop, so he felt that he was home because uh, whenever Michael would use his uh, machinery, the, the compressor would be on. Through Michael's cell phone that was in his uh, bag, I, I was able to gather contacts from the phone, uh, and we found his son. His son arrived. Michael's youngest son identifies the body. The detectives set about interviewing friends and family to get a better understanding of who Michael was, and hopefully a lead that could point to a motive for the killing. He seemed like a, a fun-loving person. He got along with everybody, kind of a free spirit. He had uh, been married and divorced and had a few kids. They all loved him, and he got along with everybody. I think even his ex-wives got along with him very well. It's apparent early on that Michael Dehakis definitely lived the hippie lifestyle. His home is in a low-income section of town that is known for its transient populations. And yet... Everything detectives are being told about Michael DeHakis, what friends and family and known associates say about him, is that he's the most stable and reliable guy they know. He was a very charismatic person, almost always had a smile on his face. Everyone said wonderful things about Michael, that he was a caring person, he was a joyful person, just this nice, peaceful soul type of guy. The more you heard about him, the more you, you kind of wished that you met him. My relationship with Michael initially was, he was my yoga instructor. A friend of mine introduced me to Michael because he was in his yoga class. And I had never taken yoga before, and so he introduced me to Michael. And we grew to be rapid friends. It's a person you could get along with very, very easily. Besides his knowledge of yoga, his charisma might have had something to do with his popularity with the female students. And he had long flowing hair, and he dressed like a hippie. He didn't even have a car. He actually drove a bicycle everywhere he went, and the girls loved him. Everyone said he was very charismatic, that he was flirtatious. He loved the women, and they loved him. He is the last person that anybody would want to murder. But someone did, and friends and family are shocked when it happens. I drove home from work and was watching the local news when it came up with a news story of a murder that had occurred midtown. And I heard Michael's name mentioned as the victim of a burglary gone wrong. When we got word that a man was shot to death on the front porch of his home, of course it sounded at first that it might have been a botched burglary. We felt that we did have a, a foil burglary, that the victim had come home and, and uh, stopped the intruders. There appeared to be um, items stacked outside his residence. There was um, uh, guitar cases, a violin case, a handbag was found on the sawhorse on the side of the house next to these these stored uh, violins and uh, guitars and a, there was a broken window in the front of the porch area uh, it looked like it went into a kitchen upon going into the, the residence we were able to see that there were more musical instruments uh, placed inside the kitchen door to go outside uh, there was an amplifier a, uh, a guitar stand and the thought was that perhaps because this was a neighborhood that had been burglarized frequently, that, um, that it was natural that, that 
that the police started looking at known burglars. We did find a large shoe print, uh, like kind of a waffle shoe print outside the front door. Could this be just another random attack gone wrong? Or has Michael's charisma attracted some unwanted attention? There were many different scenarios coming through. Both of them had been taken into custody and the handgun was involved. She had gotten drunk and pointed that pistol at her own husband. Tucson, Arizona has a darker side. Crime, drugs, poverty, and a rash of home robberies in the Midtown area. Michael Dehakis, a yoga instructor in free spirit, is gunned down on his front porch in what looks like a robbery gone wrong. We found items that were kind of a disarray in his bedroom. It looked like there was an area where there was a lot of musical instruments. Well, they weren't there anymore. They were out in the side yard. The Tucson medical examiner estimates the time of death to be sometime late Thursday evening. She felt that you know, the rigor mortis had not set in anywhere from, from three to five hours from the time we found him at 6 a.m. But determining time of death by measuring rigor mortis in the body is not an exact science. Rigor mortis is a stiffening of the muscles. It's a chemical reaction, but it doesn't always tell you an accurate time of death. It's estimated. Unless you're there, you see the person die. That's what everything is an estimate. The medical examiner shows detectives there is no exit wound. We were able to, to turn the, the victim over and find there was not an exit wound. It was a, a defect that was against the skull in the back, consistent with, with um, you know, the bullet still being in his, in his brain. Detectives check for a spent shell casing that would typically indicate an automatic handgun, but there is none to be found. They determine the weapon is most likely a revolver. A 38 caliber slug is retrieved during the autopsy. But an interesting star pattern around the entrance wound and hand scratches consistent with gun struggle pique detectives' curiosity. There were some burn patterns on the victim's forehead by the entrance of the wound consistent with someone standing a few feet away and firing a handgun. It was uh, close enough to leave the, the gassy particles of burn pattern on his forehead. Everything detectives learn only substantiates the robbery theory. Returning back to the police station, my partner and I went through all the most recent burglary arrests. So they figured somebody had come in, burglarized it, and as they were walking out of the house, Michael was coming in, and that's when he got shot. We contacted burglary detectives and found out that two known burglars had been arrested in the area of where Michael lived. Robbery division shows detectives two suspects, Joseph Keyes and David Wynn. They were known burglars in the area. The burglary that they were arrested for, I believe on Sunday evening, uh, there was a guitar involved. So that kind of piqued our interest. We were excited about that. We went to the jail and interviewed these two individuals and they were pretty much uh, defiant and, and hardcore criminals um, serving prison time before. So we didn't get a whole lot, uh, a lot of information from them, but one of them, uh, we were able to do a search warrant on his house. Police race to the suspect's home to search for evidence, hoping they can tie it to Michael's murder. Detectives find what looks like blood splatter on a bandana, pants, and shoes. At that time, we felt very likely that we found our suspect and we had the right person. Detectives send the bandana, pants, and shoe for blood analysis and request the shoe be matched against the footprint found at the crime scene. If the blood matches Michael's, their robbery hunch will have paid off. Uh, we knew we had some more follow-up to do, but our team was excited about that. While they await lab results, detectives continue to build a profile on Michael, following up with known contacts and family. From the day the, the murder happened, this was nonstop. My time during the weekend after the murder, I, was, I spent contacting many of Michael's contacts that were in his cell phone. 
Cell phones were somewhat new at the time, so it was, uh, it was difficult. As police started piecing together Michael's life and who knew him, who hung out with him, who he knew, it came up pretty quickly that he was seeing a woman who was younger than he was by about 15 years. She had been in his yoga class, but they started having an affair. And her name was Amber Trudell. Amber's name was on, on the top of his contact list. I did leave a message with her and she never got back to me. Detective Jimenez finds it odd that Amber does not return his call after the killing. Detectives also recall Michael's kids relating their story of meeting Amber and the way she reacted to their dad spending time with them. For Michael, a devoted father to his four kids, Amber's erratic behavior creates stress in their relationship. I had not known him prior to his relationship to Amber. He was flirtatious and he had that type of personality, the look that fit the yoga instructor. Michael is known to give private yoga lessons to students from time to time. He gave her private lessons because she was rather shy and didn't like to go to the yoga class with uh, everybody else. But Michael and Amber's relationship quickly goes beyond student and teacher. They are lovers. He described his relationship as being on and off. Not that it was volatile or anything like that, but they would be fine for a couple of weeks and then she'd get mad at him and then she'd stop seeing him and then they'd go back on together. And I could see why Michael liked her. She was good looking. And it seemed like a, an odd match initially because of the fact that it was on and off all the time. But Michael was just having fun, which is what he did. She uh, wanted Michael to change the way he looked. She was not happy with him dressing like a hippie. You know, with sandals and long ponytail. She didn't like that look. So I thought that was a little bit odd but yet she continued having a relationship with him. Public opinion on the case puts pressure to find the killer. But the lab results they're waiting for are about to spin their investigation in a whole new direction. Michael DeHakis is shot to death in what looks like a robbery gone wrong. Detectives follow their hunch and question two burglars arrested for home break-ins in Michael's Midtown neighborhood. We felt very likely that we found our suspect and we had the right person. But blood analysis proves them wrong. Blood on the jeans were not of our victims, so it was just excluded from my case. And detectives are forced to start their investigation over. It's a major setback in the case. They've lost valuable time and now have to go back to square one. At that point, we're, we're somewhat stuck. But the case is still active and detectives need a break before it goes cold fast. I received a call from Amber's employer and that's when our interests turned towards Amber at that point. Detectives discover Amber has worked at an accounting office for several years and is a very good employee. And she gave us information that Amber said that she had to go out of town but would return to work on Monday. It was Tuesday. Her manager felt that there was not like Amber not to show up to work. But that's not all her manager has to say. Oh, by the way, Amber is married and they live in Midtown. But she's having marital problems with her husband, Justin Goodwin, that are distracting her. Now, detectives are looking at a possible love triangle crime. The question is, who shot Michael? Could Justin be the jealous husband who finds out his wife is having an affair with her yoga instructor? There are so many questions that arise when you have someone having an affair with someone, but then somebody is killed in that love triangle. I mean, there are soap operas built on things like this. Detectives visit the bagel shop where Justin works as a night shift baker. 
but they're surprised to learn he quits just three days after Michael DeHakis is found murdered. The manager and his staff tell them they've never met his wife, but they know there are problems because of a domestic violence arrest the year before. We're able to do a records check on Amber. We did find that there was a previous arrest of her and her husband over a domestic violence type issue where a handgun was taken into evidence. There was one incident early in their marriage where she had gotten drunk and pointed that pistol at her own husband. She didn't shoot him, but it was enough to call police out. Both of them had been taken into custody and that a handgun was involved, so I felt that we need to find Amber and speak to her. But detectives have no luck contacting her or her husband. The employer saw Amber's husband, Justin, and another male loading items from their house into a rental truck. So she called us. I had officers dispatched to the, uh, the residence where Amber and Justin lived. When officers arrive, they find Justin is armed. And a handgun was taken from him. It was a semi-automatic Glock. Detectives know it is not the murder weapon since the Glock is a 40 caliber weapon, not a 38 caliber. And um, he was taken to the, the police station for questioning, and that's when I spoke to, to Justin for the first time. You not only have to look at Amber and Michael, but you have to look at Justin, her husband. Where was he? What did he think, and did he know about this going on? Where was he that week when Michael was shot? But Justin denies knowing anything about Amber and Michael's relationship. I didn't know anything until that point about her having any kind of an affair. It was hard to figure out where he was coming from because I didn't feel he was being truthful. I felt he did know where Amber was, but he stuck to his story that he and Amber were no longer together, that he was loading furniture because they were getting divorced and he was leaving, and he did not have any idea where she was. I guess that's not an alibi for me being up there. In between the time frame that you guys say that I was uh, supposedly doing whatever I was doing, or whatever you think I might have done, which I can tell you that I didn't do. He was upset. I didn't have enough to arrest him on. A concealed handgun was uh, just a misdemeanor at the time. Basically told him not to leave town and to please call us if Amber returned. But something else very interesting happens during that initial interview. During the interview with Justin, we had his cell phone in our custody in another office, and his cell phone kept ringing. The officer answers it. It's a young female asking where Justin is and who has Justin's phone. When the officer identifies himself, she hangs up. We did a trace of the phone. The phone number that was dialed from was the office phone of Extended Stay America. We had officers in that area respond. They made contact with the manager. Could the mysterious female caller in fact be the person of interest for the murder of Michael DeHakes? The whole team is perplexed about this. Was it a vindicative thing that the spurned lover did? She was pretty angry that night. We're thinking that we're letting the killer go. A Tucson yoga instructor is murdered in what looks like a home robbery gone wrong. But the case goes from a random robbery shooting to a possible love triangle. Was this cheating, did it lead up to the murder? Was it a vindicative thing that the spurned lover did? With a domestic violence charge a year prior, detectives focused their investigation on Michael's illicit lover, Amber Trudell. After tracing a series of calls made to Justin's cell phone during his interrogation, Tucson police converge on the Extended Stay America Hotel, where they find and detain the mysterious woman caller, Amber Trudell. In her room, we spoke with her, took a statement from her. We knew that we had Justin in several lies, that she was lying to us as well. So we took Amber to the police station and then we further interviewed her there. At times, she was kind of a kind of perplexed in the fact that we were not taking her to jail. 
I am would, I leaving after this, or am I going to jail? Well, it depends on, are you going to incriminate yourself? I'm just asking because I'm handcuffed to a table. We felt that she was less than truthful with us as well. Her story's changed a few times. If you didn't kill anybody, you've got nothing to hide, nothing to worry about. I need to eliminate you, and I can't eliminate you if you won't talk to me and tell me the truth. She hadn't seen Michael in a while, and she did not admit to the killing him, but that she had seen him days before, uh, that she'd been dating him. If my okay. fingerprints are there, I've been there so many times. Okay. And if my DNA is on him, I mean, we were lovers. I, we, it, I mean, of course. I denied any involvement in his death. You're going to be a suspect until I can eliminate you. Well, what does that mean, I'm a suspect? And what, I can't leave town? Or I can't leave the state? What does that mean? She said that she had been with, with Justin for a few days before and didn't know where he was, not knowing that we had him in custody. He's he, here? He's here. You put him in the spot, not me. He's being questioned right now? Yeah, he was questioned. I figured we eliminate both of you guys, get it over with, and move on down the road. Amber is visibly distraught to learn that her husband, Justin, is in custody, and she opens up to detectives. I wasn't here on Friday, though, and people can verify that. That's what I want to ask you about. You know, but I don't want to get into this thing where my husband is a suspect. Amber tells detectives she left Michael that night and traveled three and a half hours north up the I-60 to the lush city of Sholo, Arizona. Apparently, right after Amber had had this argument with Michael, she and her husband left Tucson to go to the White Mountains up north. His mother and stepfather lived there. According to Justin's stepfather, Amber had been drinking the whole time. She was outside crying at times, uh, visibly upset. She pretty much drank all of his liquor. So he knew that there was something going on. From what Justin uh, told us in his first interview, that Amber carried a gun, always carried it in her purse. We first asked Amber where the, her weapon was at the Extended Stay America, and she said, I don't have it, I don't know where it is. So it was not in her purse. She allowed us to search her purse. Detectives push Amber for the truth, citing they know she has a gun based on her domestic charge a year ago. She had no idea where her handgun was. After interviewing Justin and Amber, we decided to, to release them. We knew that they had an alibi that they were in Sholo, Arizona at Justin's parents' home uh, the morning of the 27th when Michael was found. The detective's case stalls hopelessly for a second time. The whole team is perplexed about this. We're, we're thinking that we're letting the killer go, but we don't have enough evidence to tie her to the crime because she has an alibi. The investigation has reached a standstill. We, we know that we have to get further information to determine what happened in this case. That break comes when Justin's stepfather, a retired detective himself, can no longer ignore his curiosity. Our next turning point is when Justin's stepfather calls us. He's curious about Amber being outside his residence, walking around crying and he saw her behind the, uh, the storage shed. He went back there and he started taking the, the rocks apart and, and determined that there was something buried underneath them and he dug up a handgun. It was uh, Amber's handgun. I immediately responded to Sholo, met with the detectives there, uh, took custody of the gun, drove it back to Tucson and we had analysis done immediately. It was a snub-nosed 357 revolver when I took custody of it, you could clearly see blood in the barrel of the handgun. Within hours, detectives put the weapon through ballistics. First, uh, you know, if they did any DNA on it, that's got to be done before any ballistics testing. Then ultimately it's, it's checked for operability, it's test fired. Projectiles are compared to what was taken out of the victim from the autopsy, and it is found that they are a match. Ballistics connect the weapon to the killer but detectives also show something else. What was really interesting about this, and I had never seen this in all my 17 years in homicide, was that we did a test fire of the weapon. It left a star pattern on the board that was nearly identical to the star pattern that the victim had on his forehead. The case is starting to go their way. 
with an exact match of the blood found on the gun barrel to the victims. Detectives must figure out how Amber Trudell murders Michael DeHakis when she's not in Tucson the Thursday that he dies. I definitely knew something was off. I felt, along with others in the team, that perhaps he was killed days before. I met with the doctor. We had to change our timeline. When we found Michael, Michael had larva in his eyes, and larva doesn't set in immediately after a, a fresh kill. He'd been laying there for probably two days on his porch without anybody finding him. Which to me is, is unreal. I mean, how could somebody lay in a pool of blood at the front door with the door wide open in a neighborhood where people walk him down and drive and not be found? But that's the way it happened. In Tucson, our front porches aren't like the front porches in the Midwest where you have the <laughs> nice little white railings and everything like that. It's more of a, a patio and there are some bushes in front of it. We also realized that Michael had been in rigor mortis after his death and had already gone out of rigor mortis, so he was, his body was very relaxed. Late September was a very hot, humid day, so his body temperature was warm based on that. Evidence is lining up against Amber Trudell, but detectives still have to establish a motive for an arrest warrant. One of Michael's good friends, Eli, steps forward and he says he has information about that Wednesday night and Amber Trudell's behavior that night toward Michael. It was until a week later when they had a ceremony for Michael in his honor. I was talking to several people after the ceremony and I was explained that I just saw him that Wednesday night. He also said that he had not shown up for his yoga classes on Thursday, so since I had seen him Wednesday night, they, they thought that I, there was part of the puzzle there that, that could help the police discover what was going on. Eli Curiel did come to our police station and gave me a, a, a very good interview as to what had taken place the night that Amber and, uh, and Michael were at the bar together and I talked about the argument they had and the fact that she wanted to marry him, insisted on him marrying her, and she was pretty angry that night. Michael invites Amber to join the yoga group for the ritual beer night. We usually had happy hours uh, right after our Wednesday class. We would go to a local bar, have a couple of beers. Amber had parked on the opposite side of where Michael had parked. So as we were departing, he didn't walk her to her car. He went to the back. And so she was a little bit angry about the fact that he didn't walk her to her car. She was talking to Eli as to why, you know, Michael didn't love her and why Michael didn't want to be with her all the time. And she just kept on and on. Tell him to marry me. Tell him to marry me. And I said, I can't tell him that. He's been married several times before, and he doesn't want to get married right now, but he still likes you. And she wouldn't have any of that. She was very angry. Michael, Amber, and Eli decide to go to a second bar for another drink. They started in with a little bit of an argument. So I left, and the two of them were sitting there having an argument. And that's the last time that I saw them together. I was able to determine from interviewing people at the, the second bar that Michael and, and Amber were at that they left together in late hours of the evening. And it's very consistent with Amber being with him and, and shooting him and killing him either late Wednesday evening or early Thursday morning. This proves, together with the reestablished time of death, that Amber no longer has an alibi. Detectives have enough to get their arrest warrant. Well, we can't find Amber. She's uh, not returned to work. I get hold of her employer. I get hold of Justin. Uh, Justin tells me that she'd left town. Maybe she went to Colorado. She's got a former boyfriend there. She's nowhere to be found. She's not in Tucson. They don't know where she is. Amber Trudell has just become a fugitive on the run. A 
a yoga instructor's volatile extramarital affair with his student lead to his brutal murder. Detectives recover the murder weapon and after re-establishing the time of death, debunk her alibi. Fearing arrest for the murder of Michael Dehakis, Amber Trudell is a fugitive on the run. I had never or characterized Amber as being a cold-blooded murderer. But I didn't know a lot about her. Nobody had a clue that she was married. Nobody knew that. So I assumed that she was single. And I believe everybody else did. And I was shocked, I was floored that she turned into a maniac, devil, crazy woman that was completely opposite of what I knew of her before the murder. But regardless of what anyone thinks of Amber, she's now a fugitive. The news goes out across the country. We were working closely with the Marshal Service at the time. They had agents back east watching Amber's grandmother's house in, in upstate New York. U.S. Marshals alert Detective Ben Jimenez that Amber has switched vehicles. We determined that Amber had sold the white pickup to a car dealership in Connecticut and traded it in for a red Chevy Blazer, I believe. Amber signs the sales agreement using her brother's Plainville, Connecticut address. The Marshal Service tracked the Blazer to her grandmother's house in New York behind a storage shed. And they were able to determine that Amber was there. They saw her coming in going from the house to the Chevy Blazer at times. They took her into custody, uh, determined that she may be going into Canada. United States Marshals arrest Amber Trudell for the murder of Michael Dohaquez. She was in a lot of denial. I told her she was under the arrest for, for her boyfriend at the time, Michael Dohaquez, that uh, we had the handgun, that it matched up. And uh, she didn't want to answer questions at that point. They escort her back to Tucson to stand trial for first degree murder. I was writing crime for the Tucson Citizen newspaper. By the time they arrest someone and they start going to show up in court, that's when I took over the case and started writing about this murder case. March 2005, Amber has her day in court. Everybody wanted to know Amber's story. Why did she leave? If she was innocent, because we started hearing that it was self-defense, there had been an argument, was it suicide? Was she an abused partner? There were many different scenarios coming through as she appeared in court for her hearings and her public defender started filing motions the public defender portrays Amber as the victim of Michael's sexual predator tactics over his younger and vulnerable yoga student. We had two very different competing images of Michael, the victim. Was he the fun-loving, charismatic hippie who wouldn't harm anybody, who everybody liked? Or was he an abusive, violent, controlling lover who took over Amber's life. The prosecution paints a very different scenario, that of a manipulative woman deluded with her illicit love affair who loses her temper when Michael rejects her ridiculous pleas for marriage. And so as you're watching her, you're wondering, is she what she says she is? Was this very quiet, meek person capable of cold-blooded murder, of, of putting a gun to the forehead of the man she supposedly loves and killing him. It was very intriguing to watch this playing out in the courts with all these different scenarios, nobody quite knowing who was the real Michael and who was the real Amber. In a landmark move for a murder trial, Amber and her lawyer decide to let her testify. She had a compelling story, and she appeared to get emotional and set up a case so that Michael was the one who brought about his death. She said that uh, 
Michael got mad because she said she had told him that she had to go back to her husband. As she's getting ready to leave, she grabs her purse and her gun and that he got down on one knee and grabbed the hand and the gun from from her and put the gun up to his head and said, shoot me because I'm a bad man and I treated you poorly. And somehow that gun went off. That's Amber's story. Meantime, his friends and family had come forward and said, uh, no, that, that Michael was actually thinking of breaking up with her. I don't believe her version because it's contrary to everything that, I, that anybody knew about Michael. That wasn't a mean bone in his body. And again, you're watching Amber in the courtroom being very passive, very quiet. We all felt that she was not telling the truth. And, and the way she described it, the, the gun was at his forehead, and we felt this couldn't be because there wasn't a contact wound left that was more consistent with being shot from a distance. So everyone wondered, is, is, is the jury going to buy this? Are they going to let her go? The first trial ended up in a, uh, a hung jury. There was one juror that felt that Amber was innocent. For the people of Tucson, the murder of the yoga instructor in Midtown has now entered the truly bizarre. But for family and friends still coping with his loss, the mistrial is a devastating blow. Many wondering why certain aspects of Amber's violent past are not even entered as evidence. Now, one of the things that did not come out in trial, there was a uh, audio tape that was made by her husband that was not brought into evidence. And that audio tape was very revealing about her, her character when she drank. The tape reveals her screaming at the top of her lungs, drunk, threatening to, to kill her husband. So even though a mistrial was declared and a jury couldn't reach their verdict, that didn't mean that Amber was free to leave. Prosecutors had every intention of trying her again. And so months after the mistrial, Amber was on trial again. The second trial came six to eight months later and the uh, prosecutors decided to go for second degree murder. In the second trial, because we all knew what she was going to say, I was watching her body language. When she was talking about the details of the shooting, she kept her eyes on the floor. A lot of time the experts will say that is proof of a lie. She doesn't want them to see the lies in her eyes. Amber Trudell is convicted of second degree murder and is sentenced to 13 years in jail. I did not particularly like the 13 years. I thought that it should have been more. The family felt the same way. Of course, it was up to the judge to make the determination. I've covered a lot of murder cases in my career. And this case, Amber Trudell, does stand out as one of the most interesting ones because of the human drama and the tragedy of someone like Michael, certainly the world can use many more Michaels. Every time September 24th comes around, I do think of Michael and we reminisced about Michael and his character and what we'd have probably been doing if he was still around. The fact that he was gone way too soon uh, was, was a tragedy and we just, we just miss him dearly.